All right, well, thanks, Greg. Um, just for you, you know, I'm going to actually tell you what the answers are in the course of my remarks, and uh, we'll have prizes for those who got it right. So, uh, is there a clicker? There is a clicker. Okay, okay. so I want to talk today. Normally, when we do these, I don't talk, I usually moderate, but decided I would talk today. So, I'm going to talk about kind of our view of where we are today as a country in terms of the race for global innovation advantage. How is the U.S. doing in terms of our ability to compete and thrive in the global marketplace, particularly in innovation? And more importantly, what do we need to do about it? So first question is, where are we? And this is obviously a, a, a graph of incredibly bad news. This is labor force participation. You see the red line. And you see it's down uh, quite dramatically in the recession, and now it's kind of picking up gradually. We're seeing better, in, on better employment numbers now coming out. But it certainly doesn't feel like we're out of the recession. We've been out of the recession now for 20 months. Uh, it's one of the slowest recoveries we've ever had in American history. It's one of the longest recessions we've had. Unemployment still near 10 percent. The federal budget deficit, the trade deficit is high. Manufacturing is problematic. Uh, as, as Paul Jacobs said, companies are sitting on a lot of cash because they have real trepidations about whether they should be investing now. Uh, and many cities and states are even on the verge of bankruptcy. So if we're in a recession, if we're in a recovery, it sure doesn't feel like one. So one question that is, well, what's that all about? And I think the conventional view in Washington is what that's all about is, is, is a, just a random financial crisis. So you see people like Ken Rogoff writing these books that these are, these are sort of random events throughout history. They're sort of like hurricanes. We just got unlucky. We got one. Category five, the immense financial destruction. But, you know, like a hurricane, clean up afterwards, things get back to normal. Housing prices go back up. Unemployment goes down. Economic confidence comes back. Let me suggest that that conventional wisdom is wrong that the cause of the financial crisis was intimately linked to the decline of U.S. innovation-based competitiveness, and that the recovery is going to be intimately linked to our ability to re-win the race for global innovation advantage. So let me put that in a little bit of context. Go back to the 70s. What people forget about the 70s is in 1969, we had the deepest recession since 1949. And then a few years later, in 1974, we had a much longer and deeper recession. In fact, it was the longest recession in U.S. history since the Great Depression. And at that time, there were a lot of people in America who questioned whether the U.S. economy, whether the good days were going to all behind it, whether the U.S. economy could recover, and whether the U.S. economy was fundamentally healthy. And what we found was that actually the U.S. economy did recover. Growth accelerated 10 percent faster and we came back. So in short, through that whole period, all the way through into the 80s, the economic engine of the U.S. was fundamentally healthy. But what that recovery masks and what people missed is while the overall economic engine was healthy, we had part of the engine that was running on one or two cylinders and the other that was running on all six or eight. This is a map of Ohio and Georgia. And what you saw was that in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Georgia grew 20 percent faster than Ohio. That's kind of the historical rate. The South was growing a little faster than the North. But after 74, and all the way through the 80s and into, even into the, into, the, into the 90s, what happened was Ohio's growth was half as fast as Georgia's. And we saw that throughout the country. In other words, the whole industrial belt of the United States from Massachusetts all the way up to to Minnesota, down through Kentucky, all of that whole part of the economy essentially was in stagnation for 25 years. And if we had, uh, if the South had won the war between the states, or the Civil War, or whatever you want to call it, if that had been the case, what we would have talked about was the emergent, vibrant, Confederate states of America economy, 
and the lagging, declining United States economy of the North. But we didn't because what we really had was two economies and the growth of the West, the growth of the South, just powered the overall economy. Okay, why am I saying that? Why I'm saying that is today is now what's happened is a large share of the U.S. economy is essentially what Ohio used to be, what Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania used to be. So today, now over the last 30 years, over the last 15 years, Ohio and Georgia have gone back to their historical growth rates. Georgia's growing, but not very much faster than Ohio anymore. And so as the overall U.S. economy has faced the challenge of globalization, it's essentially what happened to the, Pacific, what happened to the Northeast Midwest economy in the 70s as the U.S. economy became national, Lots of factories, lots of companies moved from places like Michigan and Pennsylvania down to places like Georgia, down to places like Texas. And today what's happened is instead of moving from, Georgia, from Ohio to Georgia, they're moving from Georgia to, Mich to, uh, to Mexico or Georgia to China. And so I would argue that we're really now in a much tougher position than we are and that the U.S. economic engine is essentially more like this. And I think that's a huge challenge that as a country we have to recognize. We're not back where we were in the 70s where the overall engine was good and a few places had problems. Now we're in a place where most places have real challenges. Let me talk about two of those challenges, one manufacturing and one about, if you will, innovation and, and technology. The conventional view in Washington is that U.S. manufacturing is fundamentally healthy. I would argue that conventional view is wrong. If you look at overall share of manufacturing in growth in terms of 2000 to 2008, what you see is that in, in these are all, by the way, inflation adjusted dollars. It grew, fi output of manufa U.S. manufacturing grew 5%. GDP grew 18%. So manufacturing is no longer keeping up with overall economic growth. It's becoming a smaller share. And I'm not talking here, by the way, just about workers. I'm talking about overall output and the importance of manufacturing. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is, if you look at the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce numbers on manufacturing, they break them into what's called NAICS codes, sort of different codes for like industries like aviation and autos and biotechnology. 15 of the 19 NAICS codes in this last decade saw absolute declines in output, not just they didn't grow and not grow as fast as the overall economy. 15 of 19 sectors of the U.S. economy are producing less today, less today, actually in 2008, this was pre-recession numbers, less today, less in 2008 than they were producing a decade ago. Now, what masks that is you have four sectors that are producing a lot more and that's why you have the overall 5% going up. But I won't go into a lot of detail, but there's a fair amount of evidence now from scholars, including our work, but certainly some academic scholars, that suggests that, in particular, the computer and electronics products numbers are significantly overinflated, uh, and that actually they uh, are, have not grown as much as we would have expected from these numbers. And so, in fact, probably if the numbers were counted correctly by the U.S. Department of Commerce Bureau of Economic Analysis, we, we would have seen as an absolute decline of overall U.S. manufacturing output in the United States in the last decade. So, we asked you that question, and do we have the answers? Are they going to pop up? There we go. Thank you. So, this is pretty evenly divided here. Uh, this is kind of a bifurcated crowd. This is the, the black or white uh, good or bad crowd here. And all the good people so sit over there, if you would, and the people who are the pessimists uh, over here. Uh, the actual number is a $200 billion deficit. And again, this is the first time in U.S. history where this has happened. We, we had a story we told ourselves in the 90s that we would lose textiles and commodity-based, low-wage skill, low-skill commodity-type production, and we would move up the value chain to the kinds of things that America is supposedly good at, which is high technology, knowledge-based production. We are good at that, but so are a lot of other countries. And as a result, we now run a $200 billion deficit in high technology advanced products. So why is manufacturing down? 
I think the evidence is pretty overwhelmingly clear that one reason is that the trade deficit is up. Now, if you, the way to read that is the red line or the orange line is the trade surplus in China, and the blue line is the trade deficit in the United States. Now, you can see it starts to look better here, but historically, the way we improve our trade deficit is we go into recessions, and then we just don't buy very much. So that can't be the strategy for recovery of U.S. manufacturing is just have a permanent recession. You know, we're going to have to grow dramatically as a country, and we're going to have to figure out a way to grow while exporting more. And obviously, President Obama has made that a key commitment uh, in his plan. But one of the things that we've seen, though, as manufacturing has gone offshore, as output has gone down, is there is just simply f less capital stock. If you add up all the capital stock in U.S. manufacturing, things like how many machine tools they have, how many computers they have, how many forklifts they have, what you see is sectors like primary metals peaked out in 1981. That was the, that was the year that the U.S. steel and metals, aluminum, copper industry production was the highest in terms of capital goods ever. It's now down 27%. Some of these you would expect, textiles down since 97, but other ones, electrical equipment. There's 5% less electrical equipment, capital equipment in the U.S., uh, motor vehicles. So this is obviously a big challenge. If we want to export more, if we want to be a country that's going to export and double our exports, we can't do it if we have less capital stock than what we had before. And this is another way to show this. If you look at overall manufacturing asset growth, Again, this is the overall sum of manufacturing assets in inflation-adjusted dollars. What you see is 50s, pretty high growth, 60s, pretty high growth, 70s, we've had a little bit of stagnation from a couple of recessions, 80s, started to come back, uh, 90, uh, excuse me, uh, 80, 89, 80s down, sorry, 80s down. And then if you look at, though, 99 to 2009, almost stagnant virtually no change in manufacturing assets. Now look at overall private assets. This would be assets that uh, a Walmart might have or an insurance company might have or other types of sectors. And you see in this last decade, overall assets have grown, but yeah. So what happened? What did we do? Well, one of the things we did in this last decade is we built a lot of sports stadiums. <laughs> the other thing we did is we invested in a lot of mutual funds. So now we can sit here in our sports stadium and on our wireless device and trade stocks. It's actually all good, I'm not knocking that. But the reality is, while other countries are driving their tax system and their public investment system towards making sure that they invest in manufacturing and technology innovation, what have we been investing in as a country? Recreation and financial engineering. So, okay. Fine, manufacturing's not doing very well, but surely we must be doing great on innovation and technology. That's our, that's our sweet spot, if you will. And we just heard about one of the leading companies in the U.S., if not the world, who is thriving. But that's one company, so how are we over, overall doing? One key indicator of that is research and development expenditures by companies. Um, actually, sorry, this is overall research and development. What that top line shows is the overall growth in percentage from 1998 to 2008. And 1990, the bottom line, the x-axis, is what's called intensity. So if you grew by 25 percent, but your GDP grew by 25 percent, your intensity didn't grow at all. And what you see is a country like China, whose R&D is growing much, much faster than its GDP. But other countries in there, Estonia, Portugal, but even, even, even some countries like Korea, but, but look at Germany, though. People wonder, why is Germany running a trade surplus? Why is Germany able to outcompete with China? And one of the reasons you can see that is Germany has increased its R&D about three times faster than America has. This is also the first time in U.S. history, at least been recorded, that U.S. R&D has gone down as a share of GDP. That's never happened before. And one of the reasons for that is U.S. R&D has grown 2.67 times faster overseas 
then overall R&D has grown in the United States. So overall R&D from American companies and then inward FDI. We've had growth in the last decade 2.6 times faster offshore. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because other countries are providing much, much generous R&D tax credits. You go to a country like France, and they provide a tax credit for investment in R&D that is six times greater than the United States. Spain is about five and a half times greater. Australia is about four times greater. Canada is three times greater. So other countries have said, we want to win the global innovation race. We're going to put in place tax incentives and other types of policies to make us be able to do that. We really haven't done that. Another way of showing that, this is the Chinese R&D intensity, the US, and then overall size of GDP. And you can see, China's catching up. They're not ahead of us, but they're making every effort to get there. So this goes back to this other question we asked. How far behind are we? Certainly we're behind where we should be, I would argue, on private R&D, but we're even farther behind when it comes to public R&D. So if we went back to 1987 and we said, how much money was the government investing in research and science as a share of the gross domestic product, and then said, what are we doing now? The answer is, most of you were wrong. Although you were actually, I would have thought most people would say 10. We're actually $60 billion short. Well, think about that. That is the equivalent of essentially creating eight National Science Foundations tomorrow. If we created eight National Science Foundations or whatever, doubling NIH again, expanding DOD 6162 research, expanding basic research at the DOE, whatever it is, we're $60 billion in the hole. Now, when you're $60 billion short and you've been doing that for two decades, that clearly is going to have impacts on a nation's ability to be a global innovation leader. You want to know why we were a global innovation leader in the 1980s? That's one of the main reasons why. So you can see that again. You compare us to other countries. You look at a country like Ireland, Spain, Korea, Russia, China, Singapore, all countries that have made big, big bets. You look at Canada. They're like us. They're an advanced country, but Canada, the Canadian government, and it doesn't matter what party in Canada, the conservatives, the liberals, they both committed to making a Canada an R&D leader by both direct investment by the government and a very generous corporate R&D tax credit. We see this in other areas. The growth of U.S. scientists and engineers is essentially stalled. This is 1999 to 2006. You can see other countries, China, Mexico, Korea, Singapore, growing much, much faster. And our college attainment has essentially languished. We're not really expanding college graduates anymore. But you again, look at these other countries who are doing much, much more than we do. And by the way, some of these countries are not just the, the laggard catcher-uppers catcher like Poland, didn't have a lot of people going to college. But there are countries like Japan, Sweden, Canada, again, who are doing much, much more than we do. The Canadians made a major commitment eight years ago to expand college graduation, including STEM, and they've made significant progress. So as a result, when you look at all of these factors, which we did in a report in the Atlantic Century, say, where is the U.S. on these innovation-based competitiveness factors? We're no longer number one. We can proudly say we're number six. But we're Americans, so we can't say that proudly. We should be number one, but we're not. We're behind Singapore, Sweden, Luxembourg. Luxembourg, I don't really care about. I've never been to Luxembourg. I don't even know where it is. It's, uh... But clearly, a country like Korea, we're behind Korea, a country that is not anywhere near. I mean, Korea is pretty advanced, but they're not as advanced as we are on the development ladder, and yet they are doing better than we are. And other countries are rapidly catching up. So this is a study we did, the Atlantic Century. We looked at 40 countries or regions, Asia, Europe, United States, North America, South America. Looked at 16 different indicators. And we said, how do they stack up? And as I said, what we found was that the U.S. is number six. But then we looked and we said, where's the U.S. now? Where was the U.S. in 2000? Where are all these other countries? So what happened between 2000 and 2008? Who made the most progress? who made the least progress. 
And here's what we found. So we made less progress on issues like expanding corporate R&D, expanding venture capital funding, expanding scientists and engineers, growing productivity. We made less progress on all of those than every single country on the list. Now, some people will argue, well, that's fine, but that's all, because all that's ketchup. Not the tomato, but the ketchup. Uh, China, Singapore, those are all, uh, Estonia, those are catching up. But look at some of these other countries, Japan, Sweden. These are countries that are making faster progress than we are. So this is obviously not very good news. So in short, what's really happened is we are significantly falling behind in this race for global innovation advantage, whether it's on what you call sort of conventional manufacturing or whether it's more on the high tech side. So what, where are we going? What's our future? Well, if you look back at the 70s and 80s and look at that region of the country that was really problematic, that Rust Belt region from Massachusetts to Wisconsin to Minnesota, and what happened to it? Well, there were two very different paths that occurred. One was the Buffalo path, which uh, we, should, we could call, I mean, no offense to people in Buffalo, but the, the path we don't want to take. Buffalo lost half its population, uh, significant loss of industry, and I'm not criticizing Buffalo, uh, they, they tried, but this was not the path that we want to go down. In contrast, you take a place like Boston, it lost half of its, some of its, half of its traditional manufacturing in a very short period of time. Some of these core industries in the Boston region were decimated. But Boston adapted, Boston transformed, Boston built on its assets of a great university system, wonderful venture capital system, and a core of high-tech companies. And it now is one of the world's leading technology regions and innovation regions. So a question for the United States is, as we go through this big transformation, as we go through this global challenge, are we going to end up as Buffalo or are we going to end up as Boston? Boston didn't get there by chance. I mean, they worked at it. So the real question for us is, are we going to work at it? And if we want to be Boston and not Buffalo, what do we need to do? Well, I think the very first thing we need to do is we need to recognize we're in competition. Now you would say, geez, that's obvious. Well, unfortunately it's not obvious to a small group but highly influential people in America called economists. Well, Paul Krugman recently wrote an op-ed in the New York Times which was 100% wrong. Paul Krugman said, we don't compete with other countries, only our companies compete. So this is the conventional Paul Krugman view. And it's not just Krugman, it's many, many economists who are advising the US government today. Economists who, I sound, I sound, like, uh, sound like McCarthy, who currently work for the US government. <laughs> work for CBO, work for CRS, work for OMB, work for Treasury. They think that's what's going on here. Boeing's competing with Airbus, Ford's competing with Toyota, Cisco, Huawei. No, 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 this is what's going on. Boeing is competing with Airbus and the European Union. Ford is competing with Toyota and the Japanese government. Why did Toyota come out with the hybrid Prius before anybody else? Because the Japanese government made massive, massive investments in battery research. And Toyota was able to take advantage of that and we weren't. Why is Cisco, Cisco's competing against Huawei and the Chinese government? So not only did Huawei steal the plans for Cisco, the Chinese government made it clear that Cisco couldn't win that case. Plus, the Chinese government is massively subsidizing Huawei exports so that they can export around the world and giving them huge subsidies to do it. But we see it in other kings, Google and Baidu. Google should be winning in China. There's a reason they're not because the government favors Baidu. IBM and Wipro. Well, again, the, uh, the, China, the Indian government is supporting Indian firms making policies there. So where's Uncle Sam? All these other countries have as partners their governments and their firms. What we do is we make our firms go out in the global marketplace of competition all alone and we hope the best will happen. I think what we've been finding is that the best does not happen. We need to make a set of policy changes so that we are helping U.S. companies, big or small, 
be able to win and compete, win, compete and win in the global marketplace. So what should Washington do? Look, I think the first thing we should do is start looking out for number six, in other words, us. <laughs> so for more than 50 years, U.S. international economic policy, and continues to do, has largely been premised on the notion that the United States is so superior, we're so far advanced, we are the city on the hill, that we can afford to be magnanimous, we can afford to practice noblesse oblige when it comes to economic policy. Good example of that, Paul Jacobs mentioned Taiwan. Taiwan is one of the world leaders now in many, many industries around innovation and technology. Why is that? One of the reasons is that 50 years ago, the United States government made a major investment in Taiwan to help them drive their technology productivity by creating the Chinese Productivity Center in Taiwan. So you think about that. We use taxpayer dollars to help Taiwan become a world leader in industrial technology, and now they're beating us. Well, that wasn't just 50 years ago. We do that now. Uh, right now, USAID and World Bank use U.S. taxpayer dollars to provide billions of dollars to China, tens of millions, if not more, for combating global warming. Okay, I understand that, that we want to help combat global warming. But you would think that perhaps we would tie that aid to a provision that says if we're going to help China combat global warming, that they actually have to have open markets for procurement of solar panels, wind turbines, and other types of clean energy devices. They don't. China refuses to buy foreign wind turbines and foreign solar panels. In fact, they haven't bought a single wind energy project from outside of the country since 2005, yet we continue to give them tens of millions of dollars every year with no strings attached. We don't tell them, by the way, oh, by the way, oh, and by the way, completely violating the WTO in the process. When we negotiate trade agreements, when you, when you negotiate a trade agreement, you have limited chits on the table. You can only bargain for so much. And we, I would argue, waste our chits essentially trying to help other countries. So it's not that we, we, we negotiate trade agreements and we focus on issues like endangered species, uh, forest protection, sea turtle protection, all of these other issues, which are global issues. I get that. But nobody else is fighting for that in the global marketplace, only us. And lastly, we continue to harangue China on human rights. You think about that. We, want, we harangue China on human rights because we want to help China. But we don't harangue them on intellectual property rights. We don't harangue them on the fact that the Chinese government steals U.S. software. The Chinese government steals intellectual property. Uh, we essentially say, we're not going to put number six first. We're not going to advance U.S. interests when it comes to international economic policy. So I think at the end of the day, we've now we really have to start looking out for number six, like every other country in the world does today. So once we do that, what do, what do we actually have to do at home? I think the key thing is what I would call getting the four T's right. What are the four T's? One is technology. We have to be able to support and fund and have the right kinds of policies for technology innovation, which I'll talk about. The second is talent. We lag on talent, particularly in the STEM area. We've got to do much, much more. Dr. Jacobs talked about it on the immigration front as well, high-skill immigration. The third is trade. Uh, we need to do two things in trade. One is we need to be much more aggressive on opening up markets, and we need to be even more aggressive on enforcing agreements. We released a report in the fall that my colleague Stephen Azell wrote called the good, the bad, and the ugly of global innovation policy, which documents very, very compellingly how other countries are systemically cheating on trade, whether it's standards manipulation so that they can favor their products against global standard products, whether it's government procurement, uh, whether it's unfair tariffs, et cetera, et cetera. We need to get tough. We need to enforce global trade agreements, not just pretend that they will be. And lastly, tax. Uh, Paul Jacobs talked about that. The U.S. tax system is simply uncompetitive. We used to be competitive. We're no longer competitive on the corporate side. Uh, we now face in the OECD the highest effective tax rates of any OECD country. We've got to do all of that. And lastly, it's got to be supported by an overarching strategy. 
The last time we had an overarching strategy was back in the 80s and the 70s. We don't have one today. And you'll hear a little later from Senator Klobuchar, who with her leadership, and also Senator Mark Warner and Senator George Lemieux from Florida, they were able to insert into the America Competes Act a provision that requires the, uh, the Department of Commerce and the Obama administration to craft, for the first time in 30 years, a national innovation competitive strategy. And to their credit, the administration is, is uh, diligently working on that, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. So, the other thing we need to do, if you look at those four T's, you know, each party has some really good ideas when it comes to those four T's. The problem is that that's not Washington. I know that's a surprise to you. But if we're going to win this, we have to really do what other countries do. And we hear, we, we, hear delega we, we meet with delegations from all around the world. And one of the things that constantly amazes us, we'll, we'll meet with a delegation and five months later, the party will be out of office, there'll be some new party, and they'll meet, another, meet again. They're like, oh, have things changed? No, there's no change. They change on social welfare policies. They change on attitudes towards immigrants. They change on all these other things. They don't change on these issues because there's bipartisan consensus in most of these countries that you've got to do all these four Ts. And we don't have that in the US. So what that really means is we've got to have a program, what I would call the Chinese menu approach. We've got to have policies from column A and column B. So if you think about column A as, as the democratic column, and I. I, I, it's a broad generalization. I don't mean to suggest that there aren't any Democrats who aren't on that side or Republicans who aren't on that side, but as a general rule, that's how competitiveness and innovation policy breaks down in Washington. You have Democrats who are committed to expanding pu public investment and innovation, which we dramatically need, as we alluded to before, 60 billion shortfall. Uh, but they're really unwilling to face the fact that our tax code is uncompetitive. And you have Republicans who are willing to say, we need to do something on the tax code, but at the same time, don't want to support an expansion of public investment. Look, if you want to be successful, you have to have a competitive tax code and supportive public investment in a wide array of innovation activities. Secondly, Republicans are right, and, and the President Obama's right, in talking about the regulatory drag on innovation and job growth. We need to do a much better job of that. But Democrats are right in the sense of we can't create a, a global thriving innovation economy if the, if the, uh, if the uh, Food and Drug Administration is understaffed, doesn't have the capability to really process applications in a timely and effective way, or the PTO with a 700,000 patent backlog, or U.S. statistical agencies which no longer measure the innovation economy the right way. We have to fund STEM education if we're going to get more uh, scientists and engineers, but we can't just rely on that. We have to rely on high skill immigration. We have to do both of those. And lastly, we have to certainly expand trade agreements, embrace globalization, and open up markets. But if that's all we do, we're not doing enough. We have to also aggressively fight mercantilist trade policies. So I would argue we can win. I hope I, I, hope I haven't made you pessimistic, because I'm not pessimistic. I think what good companies do when they face a crisis is they understand there's a crisis and then they act. Bad companies don't understand there's a crisis. We need to understand there's a crisis, we need to act. We can win, but we've got to choose both columns. And let me close by saying, I think we can learn a lot from this man. Most of you know about or remember, uh, heard about George Kennan's famous long telegram which he wrote from Moscow in 1946 when he was chief of mission. And it was that telegram that woke America up to the threat of communist Soviet Union and their largely imperialistic ambitions. And he wrote about uh, how that meant America needed to take up a new mantle for security. And if doing that, how we could become more democratic and free. Today, America faces a very similar challenge. It's not this time from a totalitarian nation with imperialistic ambitions. It's from many, many countries who are putting innovation-based competitiveness at the top of their agenda. And it's also from our own short-sightedness and inability to work collectively to move forward. Those are the challenges we face today. So let me suggest that Kennan's words of 55 years ago are as apt today as they were 55 years ago when he wrote them. And he wrote, quote, we should experience a certain gratitude to, to a providence 
which by providing the American people with this implacable challenge has made their entire security as a nation dependent on their pulling themselves together and accepting the responsibility of moral and political leadership that history has plainly intended them to bear. I think we could paraphrase that and say the exact same thing. I do think that history has intended us to bear the mantle of global innovation leadership, global competitiveness leadership, global productivity leadership, and I don't think there is a better nation who's positioned to be able to do that. But we're not going to be able to do that unless we rise to Kennan's challenge of today. We've got to rise as a country and say this is a challenge we see around the world. We're going to be up for it, but it's going to require the same kind of sacrifice that our parents made in the Cold War to fight this new economic challenge. But I think we can do it. And one of the key areas that we're going to see, one of the key things we have to do to win that challenge is we've got to be able to stand up and support whole new growth industries that are going to power job growth, innovation, and competitiveness. And clearly one of those, as we've talked about today, is the wireless industry. And in particular, this new mobile broadband business model opportunity.